back in my secondary school days, um, my favorite subject by a long shot was engineering. Uh, so we used to call it metalwork, uh, but it covered all sorts of different, different aspects of engineering. And it was fantastic for a young fella because you got to play with fire and machines and danger and hammers and all sorts of things. You got to make an absolutely deafening noise as well, just hammering steel, kind of just for the crack. You wouldn't even be really doing that and just, just hammering the, we got, had a bench block, everyone got a block of steel and just mayhem, absolutely fantastic. Um, but one of the coolest things we learned how to solder as well. So soldering, you have, to, you have your soldering iron and you have your, your wire, your solder wire, and you have to put them without roasting the component. You have to get, get enough heat so that it'll, it'll melt and drop. And when it melts, it turns into silver. It turns bright and silvery. And then you can only move it, use it for a couple of seconds, if even, and then vroom, it just turns kind of foggy and goes solid again, All right? And uh, this, I, I, I was thinking of this today when um, we, we read, read our reading. For God is like the refiner's fire and the fuller's alkali. He will take his seat as a refiner and purify. He will purify the sons of Levi and make them and refine them like silver and gold. We obviously have, probably have never worked with silver or gold. I can't imagine any of you just sitting at home melting a pot of gold. And so it's kind of an unfamiliar concept to us. I think uh, back in the day, the Jews would have had a much more hands-on experience of all of these things. Uh, but for jewelers back in the day, and there were jewelers, people did wear jewelry, they did have earrings and nose rings and finger rings and whatever else, they, 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 there were jewelers there. Uh, so people would have seen how the thing worked. So when you got your, your silver or your gold, you had to be very careful that the, 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 there was an art to it, right? Where you had to melt the silver or the gold. Now, if you, if you melted it too hot, you'd actually ruin it. You can actually burn it effectively. And if it wasn't hot enough, obviously, the impurities wouldn't come to the top. So when the impurity, so you heat it up, and then the lighter stuff, the, the unnecessary things, the impurities come to the top, which you have to very carefully scrape off or you pour it out from underneath. So you have to find a way of getting off your impurities, okay? And obviously leave as much metal as possible because it's very expensive, it's, it's very uh, precious, okay? So you get rid of the impurities while still leaving the thing intact. And what was it then? How, was, how did you know when you'd done enough? How did you know when it was pure? So if you're sitting there, you're sitting there, that's why it, 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 it's very deliberate how they phrase it. It's like he will take his seat as a refiner and purifier. This is a slow process. Okay, you have to sit, you have to sit down. You sat down, you heated the thing, and you looked at it. And as the impurities came to the top, you had to pour them off or scrape them off. When were you finished? As refiner, you were finished when you saw your reflection. That's when you knew it was done. When you can see your reflection all around, I, I do some kind of something similar almost with the patterns there, like not that I look at myself <laughs> during mass, but you know, when, when you can see your, your reflection clean and you can't, you can't see any white specks, you know it's done, you know it's clean, you know it's purified. So similarly, like the refiner would sit down there and he'd look and he'd purify and engage in this slow process until he could see his reflection. When he could see his reflection, it was finished. And in this, this reading from the prophet Malachi, this is, how God, this is how the prophet describes God's relationship with us. That patiently, he sits down and he boils us. <laughs> and we're exposed to different uh, difficulties, crosses, adversities, uh, temptations, all of these things which kind of make life difficult for us. It's not God's fault. God doesn't want Sin, nor does he want this, this, the, the consequences of sin. Absolutely not. But in his divine wisdom, he's able to use them, just like the cross. Does God, did God want his son to die? No, but this was the only workable solution for, for sin. So in that sense, he did want his son to die because he wanted us in heaven. But it, was, it wasn't his idea to, for God to become man uh, just to see him suffer. That's, that, that, would, that would distort our view of God. It's not the suffering that's important, it's the love with which the suffering is carried. That becomes transformative. And so we're exposed to different adversities and crosses and difficulties. And these things, they, they, 
they make us anything but comfortable. You know, that word today that was used so much, you know, comfortable. It's, it's, it's very uncomfortable. Just like the pruning process, if we can call it the refining process, either or. It's not comfortable, okay? But it's being guided. It's being guided by a divine hand. And we're heated as much as we can handle, as much as is necessary for the process to get done, for, for this purification to take place. And with the, this guiding hand of God, then the, the, the impurities are removed. Until what? Until God sees his reflection in us. In other words, until we become Christ-like. God the Father doesn't have a reflection because of God the Father doesn't have a body. But the image of God is Jesus. And so this, this process that we go through here in life, it's to make us Christ-like. It's to make us like Jesus. So that we react, we talk, uh, we pray as Jesus would. And as I say, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a necessary process. It's a good process, but it's not comfortable. Just last night, actually, I was, just, uh, I was up in my hermitage having just a little moment of prayer. And I, said, and I said to the Lord, Lord, why is it? Why, <laughs> why is it? Why is it that I still sin? You know, I don't want to sin. I don't want to sin anymore. I'm tired of sinning. I'm enough of it. I was, good enough at it as a, I was good enough at it as a young fellow. I don't need to sin anymore. That should be done. All right? I, just, I, 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 want to be, I want to be virtuous. Uh, so I said, Lord, why, why is it that I sin? And he said, because you love me so little. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> but he's right, like. He's right, you know. I remember um, the founder of our community, Father Paul, uh, when, we, when we would talk about fasting and, and general sacrifices, you know, and how it's, it's difficult to, 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 to sacrifice or you know, give up smoking or whatever the lads were struggling with at the time. And uh, I just remember once he just said so, so, just so, so clearly and bluntly, he said, if we have difficulties fasting or sacrificing, it's not that we're so attached to food or whatever the thing is, it's that we don't love the Lord enough. We don't love the Lord enough. That we should love him more. So out of love for him, we renounce whatever the thing was. There you are. Just like, you, you know, as a, it's much more tangible when a mom or dad has a child and then you have to renounce sleep in order to change the child's nappy or you have to renounce uh, your free time because you have to stay, you know, you have to watch the child 24, seven, well, almost 24-7 for the first couple of years. Uh, so, you know, you're constantly, under, everything kind of revolves around getting that child what it needs, feeding, changing, company, rests, naps, and all that. And it's, it's much more tangible that, that, that you have to make all of these sacrifices for this person you love. It's very visible. It's that bit harder for us to make sacrifices for a God that as yet we don't see. A God who we will see. Our Mother Superior in my community, Mother Agnes is her name, she got COVID, actually, a couple of weeks ago. And she was doing very, very badly. She was in hospital, and uh, she sent us an email there <clears throat> last week describing what it was like. She was brought into ICU, and she said uh, she, after a day or two, actually just pretty much went on, went went unconscious. She was just couldn't hold a conversation and just slept all the time. And she said she remembers very clearly, very vividly seeing these, what she describes them as kind of uh, frosted glass doors, right? So the, the, there, was, there was great light emanating from behind it, and she knew that God the Father was behind it. She was like, oh, fantastic. I want to go in. I want to just be there. I just want to be with God. I just want the embrace of, of my Father. And there's just this great desire to, to go in and to be there. Uh, interesting, like, because... You know, she's, not, she's not old, but just being that close to God, I'd be willing to leave everything behind. Okay, I'll, I'll take the next couple of steps. On we go. And then she got this realization of, of who she was, how she was before him, right? Now, you have never met Mother Agnes. Uh, she's quite incredible. Um, so prayerful, so incredibly patient, and always has time for everyone. All right, this is how she does it. Like, uh, she just, and uh, incredible depth of knowledge of scripture. Like a lot of the, the homilies that I would give here would be ideas that I learned from her. Actually, 
where I spent a little time in Motherhouse over the summer doing a bit of work. Uh, it's just wonderful, wonderful uh, lady um, who yeah, I probably would have considered a saint, but she said that seeing herself before these, these opaque glass gates, she saw herself and she said, I recognised something very important. She said, I could see that I was, without boasting, she said, I could see that I was good, but that I wasn't a saint. I was good. You know, she's not, you know, she's not out there throwing cats into bags into rivers or something like, like she's, she's a good person, you know. Uh, but what she could see that she, she's, she's not a saint. And when I read this, I did, it's like the second blow I got this week. I was like, oh, Madris, <laughs> Janie, if she's not a saint, oh, I don't stand a chance. You know, and these, these are good things. I think these are good realizations to have, you know. The bar isn't, <laughs> isn't there. It just isn't. <laughs> Sanctity is a high bar. Sanctity is a very, very high bar. Now, the Lord is patient with us, and he does take, well, it's not so much he takes his time. We need time. And I think with saints, like, you know, your St. Teresa, was your, your Faustinus and that, he was able to move quicker because they were able to move quicker. And I think he'll get the process over with as quick as, as, quick as we're able to handle. But, yeah, it's, it's a process, and it's, it's not easy. Uh, to become a saint. It's not. It's not. But that still is the goal. And what a lofty goal it is and what a beautiful goal and what a worthy goal it is. The Lord today is presented in the temple. He who was sinless and perfect is offered to God. And each one of us, in virtue of our baptism, has been offered to God, consecrated to him. Today we bless Candles, which will also be used tomorrow for the blessing of, of throats of St. Blaise. And this is our, our vocation, to carry light into the world, even though we're imperfect. It's kind of a contradiction in terms, really. We're supposed to carry light when we're not, we're not entirely light ourselves. But the Lord does use us, and the Lord is, is engaging in a process to, to purify us, and dare I say, even to purify the church as, as a whole. It's the same, same idea, same process, and the same guiding hand. So we ask the good Lord today, as we, as we pray for the renewal of the church and for the renewal of the priesthood, we pray, Lord, that we will not resist this purifying process, difficult as it may be, that we will trust you, and that we will trust that uh, we need to be purified, that we're not saints yet. And that we will trust that in the end of the day, when we find ourselves in your embrace, everything, everything, everything will have been worth it. Amen.